And we are live. Welcome everyone to this installment of Nate's Big Five. Today or tonight rather, we're talking about my favorite part of all of our adventures, which is the adventure for a cause component. Uh, one of the major reasons I started Adventure Out Loud was because I wanted to use travel as a catalyst for making a difference. And that's how this Adventure for a Cause component started. It's really integral in everything we do. And tonight I'm excited to expand on that a little bit more and to, um, so I suppose, outline how it came to be, what we do exactly, how you can get involved and how you can make a difference next time you travel. So just in case you don't know about Nate's Big Five, this is an adventure showcase where we showcase off the beaten track destinations in Africa. And whilst this isn't an off the beaten track destination as such, our, um, our adventure for a cause component is highly effective because we immerse people into communities. And so from that point of view, it is definitely off the beaten track. And we'll talk about some of the communities that we immerse you into. So looking forward to getting to, into that. Now, if you don't know who I am, my name is Nate Tyaroa and I am the founder of Adventure Out Loud. I've been traveling, living, guiding, volunteering in Africa for more than 10 years. And I'm incredibly passionate about finding ways to make the world a better place. And as I said, that's part of the reason I started Adventure Out Loud uh, back in 2015. And Adventure Out Loud is an African adventure specialist on a mission to make a difference in the world by donating 50% of our profits to keep disadvantaged children in school. Um, we, we specialize in the more off the beaten track type experiences, the ones you've never heard about. Uh, while you come to Africa to do safari or Kilimanjaro or go see the gorillas, we really like to pair that with an adventure you've never heard of, which often is uh, more exciting than what the actual tourist attraction is that you came, came to see. So we really love making those handcrafted type experiences. And we offer experiences all the way from Egypt down to Cape Town. And you see a couple of cool photos there of some of the experiences that we offer. As I said, we donate 50% of our profits to keep disadvantaged children in school. And over the last almost six years, we've sponsored more than 100 children through school. We've raised quite a decent amount of money and we've also partnered with a number of local charities and initiatives to make an, an impact in the countries and the communities that we visit. And I'm actually, these figures are a little bit old because uh, that number should at least be 103 because we've just sponsored another student in Ethiopia and I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a moment. So before we jump into the education side of things and how important that is in Africa, I also wanna talk about some of the other adventure for a cause components briefly, because in addition to donating 50% of our profits, we also are a responsible tourism operator, which to us means that we put the same emphasis on doing the right thing as we do on making a profit. And so some of the ways we do that is by buying local where we can, staying in local guest houses or boutique hotels, supporting local companies so that most of the money that you pay for your trip stays in the community that you're visiting. And that's really important to stimulate the local economy and to create local jobs. And it's also something that we, we spend a lot of time working with the companies that we, um, that we use as suppliers helping them better understand their business, better run their business, doing entrepreneurship and business coaching with them. And, and help, particularly because my background's finance, helping them better understand their finances. And that's a value add that Adventure Out Loud does. We also try and reduce our environmental footprint. One of the ways we do that is by carbon offsetting our flights. Another really good example is on Kilimanjaro, you're not allowed to take disposable water bottles. However, and if you do, it's a 50 US dollar fine per day. So a lot of people were bring reusable water bottles, but most of the tour companies we see 
or buy one and a half liter or one liter water bottles, disposable water bottles, to then tip into the reusable water bottles on day one. And I'm talking about, and I'm not going to name them, but I'm talking about some of the biggest tour operators in the world who talk about being responsible and eco-friendly tour providers. One of the things we do very differently is we buy large bottles, so 20, 30, 40 litre kind of bottles and refill your water from that because these bottles are reusable and they're very valuable in communities. So they're not a single use plastic product. So those little things are something that we put a lot of emphasis on doing right. I'm sure there's things that we don't do right as well. However, you know, if it's ever brought to our attention, we definitely address it and it's, it's really important to us. We also are really passionate about preserving local culture and traditions. And as part of most of our trips, you can go and visit a local tribe. And part of the reason we do that is so that you can better understand um, some of these cultures and, and traditions, and it's a really immersive experience, but also so that we can contribute to those local communities and, and keeping their culture alive. One of the big issues with cultural communities is, or, or local communities is the young people leave to earn money. So if they can earn money in their community, then they can also stay in their community and make a difference with the education and the extra, extra skills that they have. Another thing we're really passionate about, and I've just pulled out the, uh, you know, the four or five things um, that are key. We also have many others, but it, and one of the top five is definitely supporting animal conservation. And as part of all your trips through Kenya, we visit um, the David Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage. And this is a really great project that's been around since 1977. And they rescue baby elephants and rehabilitate them back into the wild particularly where a baby elephant has fallen down a well or, or the mum's been poached or whatever the reason is, the baby elephant can't survive by itself. So David Sheldrick come out, they rescue that elephant, they rehab them over the next you know, half a dozen years and then they put them back into the wild. They also do really great work with educating children in Kenya about poaching and why it's important not to poach and also educating tourists not to buy ivory and, and those types of things. Another one which I really love is the uh, Nairobi Draft Centre. This is a really special place to visit. And whilst I'm not uh, a big fan of con uh, coming into contact with animals in this kind of manner, it, it does serve a purpose in the fact that the funds raised by this um, centre go towards breeding endangered Rothschild drafts and then releasing them into the wild. So whilst there's half a dozen drafts that are in this more tourist centre, that uh, generate income, that income is used to breed endangered and, and endangered species and release them into the wild. And over the last, you know, 40 odd years, they've done an incredible job. So they've, they've been one of the major drivers with making sure that this type of draft doesn't become extinct. And that's what, one of the reasons why we support them. And I can see Val smiling. I've got her on mute, but I can see Val smiling because she's been over there and experienced this. And it's, it's a pretty special experience. Now on the education front and the reason why we donate 50% of our profits to keep disadvantaged children in school is because we believe it's, it's one of the best ways to fight poverty. And there's 111 million children or African children that aren't in school right now. And we're not okay with that. And, we, we figured we'd do something about it by one, putting our money where our mouth is and donating 50% of our profits, but two, making it possible for our adventurers to personally sponsor and contribute to keeping children in school. And many of the people that travel with us actually personally sponsor, and we're going to hear from a couple of, it, of them in a little bit. Education, I think, is such a critical issue in Africa because 60% of Africans are under 25 which means that they should be in school or university. They should be getting an education. And many of them aren't. And whilst things have definitely gotten better over the last couple of years, there is still a lot of work to do. And one of the biggest barriers is um, the cost of education. So I'll use Kenya as an example, because that's where we do a lot of our work. In Kenya, a, pri a primary school education costs you about 50 US dollars just for a really basic school. 
most families can scrounge $50 and keep their kids in primary schools. However, if they're late with their payments, their kid will be kicked out of school for a period and will lose that period of their education. We'll, we'll probably not be able to make that up. They'll just be expected to come back when the money's paid and slot right back in. When you get to high school, the education costs about 750 US dollars a year. And for most people living below, or for everyone living below the poverty line, that's mathematically impossible. If you live on $2 a day, you cannot afford to send one of your kids to school for $750 a year. And so that's one of the biggest barriers. The other barriers are um, the quality of education. It's not unheard of, or it's very common to have classes of 50, 100, even up to 200 students in one classroom with one teacher. And when that teacher only has the resources of a blackboard and some chalk, it's quite hard to teach 200 students. So these barriers all add up to being part of the issue with students not going to school. The other issue obviously is in, in very remote areas, schools aren't available. So kids often have to walk sometimes 10, 20 kilometres to get to school. If you've got to walk 10 or 20 kilometres to get to school and then to get home, you're going to spend a lot of hours just walking to school every day. And that adds a big barrier for students that could also be at home contributing to um, looking after the, the herd or farming vegetables or whatever it is that their family does. So there's some of the barriers as to why children don't go into school. And I want to talk about more specifically our major charity partner over the last five or six years, which is the Mirror of Hope. And I suppose put those barriers or, or those statistics into reality or, or explain how it works in Kenya. So in Kenya, for example, approximately 90% of students will complete primary school, which is pretty good. However, only about 50 of those percent will graduate from secondary school and only about 4% will graduate from university. So you can see how things very quickly drop off. And I dare say a very large percent of the ones that do graduate secondary school and university are sponsored. So it is a really important um, component of keeping kids in school. If you don't know about the Mirror of Hope, they're based in Nairobi, Kenya, and they're empowering vulnerable women and children living in Kenya's largest urban slum through education and entrepreneurship. Um, we particularly help them with their education piece. And what we do is we find sponsors for students going to secondary school. If you've never heard of Kibera slum, picture the suburb that you live in with, and then put a million people into it. So in a two and a half square kilometre area, a million people live. And all of these people are living below the poverty line. And that's why the work that Mirror of Hope done is, do is so critical. I was really hoping tonight to have Jacob on the line, who is the, the gentleman in this photo here. Jacob is our first student to graduate university and he was supposed to be on to tell his story and talk about how much education means to him. However, he's had to travel back to his village and as such, he doesn't have Wi-Fi. So not, nothing major, he just had to go back and um, so he can't join us tonight. So I'll quickly tell Jacob's story. And that's effectively that Jacob is an orphan. And whilst this is a picture of him and who he calls his mum now, it's actually his auntie. Both of his parents died when he was um, a young boy. And he has two younger siblings. And Jacob did very well in primary school. However, his family didn't or his auntie didn't have the money to send him to secondary school. And he had heard that there were schools in Nairobi that would offer scholarships. So he hid in the back of a bus with the avocados and mangoes because he didn't have the money for the bus fare and came down to Nairobi knowing nobody and, and lived on the streets, <clears throat> pardon me, until he could find a school that would sponsor him. And the way he found a school that would sponsor him was he walked up to one of these schools and the guard stopped him and said, you're not allowed in. And he said, do you know who I am? I'm the, the principal's or the headmaster's uh, nephew. Let me in right away or you'll be in trouble or you'll get fired or something like that. And the security guard fell for it and let him in. And he walks into the, the headmaster's office and says to her, if you let me into your school, I'll be the best student by the time I graduate. And she, I suppose, appreciated the audacity and the 
ingenuity that he'd shown and gave him a scholarship. And at the end of his four years of secondary school, he was the top ranked student in that school. And I met Jacob while he was volunteering at the Mirror of Hope after he'd graduated school and he was waiting for his marks to go to university. However, again, he didn't have the funding to go to university and the, there aren't good scholarship programs in Kenya for university, hence why there's so few people that go through university. And so Adventure Out Loud decided to sponsor Jacob to go to university. And on the back of that, he's now graduated. He has a full-time job. He started a business which doubles his income. He's put both of his siblings through a, like a TAFE course so that they have employment. He's plastered his mum's house and put electricity and a TV in there so she can be a little bit more comfortable. She now has regular food. Um, and so life has changed a lot for Jacob and he only graduated in the last couple of years. So this is the type of impact that education can have on one person's life. And one of the reasons why we started Adventure Out Loud was because I think it's really hard to find a way to make a difference when you live in a place like Australia. Like all the world's problems seem too big and you're not quite sure where to start. And so we thought by having people sponsor individual students through school, it was a place to start that you could afford and that was easy for you to do. And that's, I suppose, the message with sponsoring students is you're not gonna change the world, but you definitely can empower this student with the skills that they, can, that they need to get a good job and change their own circumstances. And often what happens is that student will then change the circumstances for their family and their wider community. And over time with enough people graduating from school, you'll find that um, more, or more, more educated people will mean they can vote better, they will be able to hold their politicians accountable and they'll be able to get rid of some of the wider issues in Africa, which predominantly is corruption. So that's a little bit about Mirror of Hope. And what I wanted to quickly talk about is some of the feedback we've had, because as I said, in addition to us donating 50% of our profits, we also make it possible for you to sponsor. And you don't have to visit to sponsor. If you want to sponsor through us, please reach out. That is also possible. So these couple of people couldn't be with us tonight, but I wanted to share their, their testimony. And the first one is the lady Jane here in the picture. And it was a really special moment when Jane met Brian back in 2020. And what Jane had to say was, meeting my sponsor and his family was a very emotional experience for me. I discovered that I can change the world one child at a time through education. I think that's really well said. The other testimony I wanted to share is from Kelly who came on a trip in 2017 and she said, going on a holiday that makes a difference is something truly special. To meet the young person that I sponsored, to visit their home and to create some amazing lifelong memories with them is just another level. And what I want to quickly do is I want to unmute Val and bring Val into the conversation because Val has actually been over to East Africa. She came, um, she came last year, actually, in 2020. And Val, can you just quickly explain what it was like to meet your sponsor student, Cyril, and that whole experience going to the slum? How, how did that make you feel? Oh, that was pretty amazing. So it, it's really hard to describe the emotions that came like the first time I met Cyril. So I have been um, talking to him through letters exchange for the last three years until I met him for real. And it all just became, yeah, became real. And he became part of my family in a way, um, meeting him and um, his family, his brother and his mom just makes the whole experience like much more real in my daily life, um, especially being someone that most unlikely won't have children on my own, um, knowing that I can make a difference and seeing the difference it makes um, and knowing where they live and everything is just unbelievable. Like it was the best experience I've had and I had so much fun, um, you know, talking to him and really discovering 
the real person he is and the amazing boy he is. He's such a big boy. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, I had so much fun with him, like just dancing and talking and chatting and his dreams. And and his mom was so so welcoming and so happy to to know that um, his son will be, like her son will be all right uh, and will have a chance um, to, to have a good life. Hopefully in the future, it's just unbelievable. Like it's it's really hard to describe the emotions that came the first time I saw him. I was like, what? what? Like really, really cool. Well, with with you, Val, we actually had Cyril come out and meet you at the airport, yeah, right? And, and which I was not expecting at all. So it was just like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really didn't know he would be there. And it was just so amazing, so surprised. And yeah, he was happy to see me straight away and just straight away had a like hugged him and was like, oh, you're my family here. Like you, you yeah, you, you're my boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, one of the things you said really, that was really interesting in there is you talked about how happy his family was to meet you. And that's something that's a, a very common piece of feedback we get from the families is we, we cop a little bit of criticism by taking tourists into a vulnerable area like a slum. However, we're not doing it from a tourism point of view. We're doing it from a cultural immersion point of view. And when you come in, you actually go in for a full day at least. And on the way, you walk around and you buy ingredients. And those ingredients are taken to your sponsor student's um, home. And you learn to cook a traditional Kenyan feast with your sponsor student. So you're, and, and this is over a charcoal stove. So this is not happening quickly. This is a good two or three hour experience. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> like it takes time to cook together, but it's so much fun actually. Uh, we, it's really a beautiful moment that we can share with, um, with the people. And um, yeah, you, you can't do that on any other holidays that adventure allowed anyway. And um, yeah. <laughs> Well, it's also interesting because it gives you a chance, if you've got two or three hours, it gives you a chance to get to a deeper conversation than just a high and by. So you start talking about what your backgrounds are, where you came from, how you got here. And that, that's, yeah. they share that and then you also share that. So it's a very deep, immersive experience and that's yeah. why we designed it that way. Yeah, definitely. And I was fortunate enough to spend another week um, at Mirror of Hope. So I went back a, a couple of times in the slum and met again with Cyril's mom and just did a surprise and she was so happy and just, and even for me, it was so emotional. And I think even my friends were saying on the photos we've seen of you, I've never seen you so happy ever. Like everyone was like, you're such, yeah, you look so happy just being there and meeting these amazing people that want to have amazing stories and, and they are so humble. Like I was so amazed how humble they are and how smiley they are all the time. They really are. They really are. And that's one of the things I love teaching tourists is, is that even though these people live in poverty, they are so happy and they're so amazing, resilient, such amazing, yeah. resilient people. So Definitely. Thank, you. thank you for sharing Val. I want to throw over to Kim as well. And Kim is actually coming to Africa she was supposed to she, well she's supposed to go to Africa in January so fingers crossed borders are open but Kim you've also sponsored a young man called Felix and can you quickly run us through what it's like to sponsor a student the correspondence and that process and how excited you are to meet Felix when you finally make it to Kenya yeah no it was great the process was really easy made by yourself obviously and and speaking with Jacob, the gent you spoke about that was works with the Mirror of Hope. And, um, sorry, I forget the other gentleman's name that I've had correspondence with. But and Felix has been just so appreciative and happy, and that that they've been given this opportunity. And I mean, for a small small amount on our behalf, gives them such a great deal to look forward to in their life, and it's. Yeah, it's just a no-brainer to me to help these guys out. And, yeah, I can't wait to go over and see them and, and visit their country as well and, yeah, join in and see what's happening because Felix wants to be a mechanical engineer, so he asks a lot of questions. I work in the mines, obviously, with heavy machinery and, 
he asked a hell of a lot about what I do and what the machinery is and that. So hopefully that inspires him to keep going and, and yeah, come visit Aussie one day. <laughs> well, one of the things you should do, Kim, and this, this is advice we give to everyone coming to visit is rather than big bringing gifts like an iPhone or something electrical or a big gift, what we prefer you to bring is photos. So I know Felix would love a couple of photos of some big machinery from the mines, if you can get some. Yeah. Uh, I think that would be awesome. And the other thing he would love would be photos of you and your friends and family, because what they do is when you print them out, they put them up on their wall and it allows them to remember you once, once you've left. So definitely bring some of them when you come over, Kim. I will, I will. I'll load the phone up. Or print them out, I guess. So yeah, they'd be no. Yeah, print them, print them out so that they can put them on their wall. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I can't wait to take you over and meet Felix, Kim. I know it's yep. been a long, long time coming, and hopefully things progress so that we can go next year. We'll just uh, see how COVID goes. Awesome things come to those who wait, eh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now. I also want to give a shout out to our, uh, sorry, just back on Mirror of Hope quickly. Mirror of Hope have actually, were well, they're in the process of moving location. The place that they'd previously been given free rent for the last 10 or so years needs them to move. They're running out of space and they found another place to locate to. However, there are some costs involved in moving. So if you would like to contribute to the six and a half thousand US dollars they need to raise to put down some foundations and build some or repair the buildings that are already there, put a fence up, that type of stuff, then please go to mirrorofhopecbo.org and you can donate directly there. Now I want to give a massive shout out to our newest sponsor student, Kalida. Kalida, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it to be honest. She is a little girl in Ethiopia at St. George's School. And Laura and myself have actually decided to sponsor her. We, uh, we saw a little picture of her and we just couldn't resist. And we'd, we've actually both visited this school and we'd talked about sponsoring at this school. And, and when we saw a picture of her and knew that she needed sponsorship, we, uh, we decided to sponsor her. So St. George is a school in Gondar, Ethiopia and they provide a free high quality education to more than 400 disadvantaged children. It's a very, very good education they provide. And I've been there to see it. The money that you donate to St. George's goes to a really good cause. They also donate 100%. So 100% of the sponsorship money you donate goes to putting kids through school. None of it's lost to admin, which is really important. That's the same at the Mirror of Hope as well. And over on the bottom right, you can actually read a little bit about um, Kalita's story. And she effectively, her parents had to go out and work. So she was effectively left at home by herself. And so she really appreciates being in a safe environment like St. George's school, having regular food and teachers that can invest in her development. And it's, it's really going to be amazing to share that experience with her over the next 12 years or whatever it'll be while she goes through school. So I'm looking forward to that. And just on St. George's, we are currently looking for sponsors. There are 19 more students that need sponsors for 2021. So if you would like to sponsor or you know someone that would like to sponsor, please reach out to us. Sponsorship is 60 Australian dollars a month or 30 pounds. And you can donate directly through an Australian organisation that I'm involved with called Mwembe. And I'll give you those details online later. Um, and that makes it really easy for you to bank transfer so that we don't lose any fees and all of your money can go across to sponsoring that kid through school. Now, that's a, that's a bit of a highlight of what the Adventure for a Cause model is and how important it is to adventure out loud. Just a little story around how we got to, to deciding to donate 50% of our profits to charity is I kept talking about how we're a social enterprise and to us that meant um, 
putting the same emphasis on doing the right thing as making a profit. And so to me, that basically meant that if we truly believe that and we're going to walk the, the, the walk, then we should be donating the same profit to charity as what we keep ourselves. And so that's where we came up with the 50% going to keep disadvantaged children in school. Now, I want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions. And I know we're live on Facebook and we're also, we have Val and Kim on the line. So if either of them or you on Facebook have any questions, please feel free to ask them now. No questions, Val or Kim? No, I'm all good, thanks, no. Wonderful. Sure. Well, if you do have questions, you can either post them on our YouTube or our Facebook video. You can also obviously reach out. My personal email or my, my company email is nathan at adventureoutloud.me. And the number there is also one you can reach me on. People often ask why we chose .me instead of .com and it's a little bit corny, I suppose, but change starts with me. And that's why we, we chose .me instead of .com. So if you would like to make a difference next time you're adventuring, please reach out. We've got an amazing community you can be part of, even if you're not going to travel anytime soon. Join the Adventure Out Loud community so you can get regular updates. You can also then be surrounded by like-minded people. We do also offer uh, events in Australia. So either these type of online informational type events or occasionally we do hikes, fundraisers, um, fun yoga sessions, all those types of things. We definitely have some Australian tours coming up as well. There's going to be a couple of yoga adventures. So keep an eye out on those. And together we can definitely use travel as a catalyst to make a difference in the world. Thank you to everyone that has been part of our journey over the last five years. It has been an incredible journey. We've made a, a really big impact so far and I can't wait to get back into travel and continue making an impact for many years to come. So thank you very much for being part of our journey and our story. Thank you, Nate. I would say I'm say, <laughs> And just a quick heads up that Nate's Big Five has obviously come to an end today because this was our fifth episode. However, people have been asking for us to continue showcasing travel in Africa. This is a way for us to, I suppose, live vicariously through travel, even though we can't travel at the moment. So next episode is going to be on one of my favourite mountains in the world, which is Mount Kilimanjaro. Kim is coming to climb Kilimanjaro next year. And so this is going to be an informational session all about Kilimanjaro, some of the facts you need to know, which route you should do, how many days you should trek, what gear you need, all those kind of need to things that you should know before you trek Kilimanjaro. So join us on the 28th of April and every month going forward, we're going to have a, a new episode, which will be something on safari or gorillas or chimps or whatever it might be. Send in your suggestions to my email, nathan at adventureoutloud.me and we'll see you on April the 28th. Bye.